Lately, while driving around Los Angeles, one experience is becoming more and more frequent. Cell phone towers masquerading as trees. Have we noticed these photosynthetic pretenders? Sometimes they stand alone, other times they are strategically planted among real trees. Most are disguised as pine trees, some of which I admit have made me do a double take. But the towers fronting as palm trees are fooling no one. The ubiquity of this fake foliage, of course, conceals our collective addiction to our phones. The false fronds, a cover for our demand for seamless calls and streaming no matter where we are. Well-intentioned as these designs may be, I confess the cover-up is more off-putting to me than a tower that simply stands there as a tower. At least it's telling the truth. Seeing a new tower trunk on the two highway on my drive into church this week had me thinking of all that passes for an apology today, but is not. The ever vague, sorry, or I'm sorry if I hurt you, I apologize if I offended anyone, it was not my intention. Then I thought of all that fronts as the whole truth and nothing but the truth, but seems to conceal more than it reveals. Our language drips with legalese to protect and save face. In public and online, we craft these facades of identity and personhood to protect and save the face of our egos. We bury who we are, suppress any secrets filled with tales of harm we've caused, intentionally or unwittingly. And the feelings of guilt and shame that accompany them get pressed down too and the fear of the consequences would the truth come to light. Step five is about ending the lie. We admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. The wisdom of this step and the way of Jesus invite us into a space of radical honesty, for in the tilling of this ground, the soil of mistakes and failures, failures and wrongdoing can become the setting and opportunity for new growth, even transformation. As any good therapist, mine included, would say, we cannot heal what we do not acknowledge. David White says that confession is the stripping away of protection the telling of a truth which might once have seemed like a humiliation becomes suddenly a gateway, an entrance to solid ground, even a first step home. Jesus describes this moment for the prodigal in our parable as coming to himself. Far away in the distant land, half of his father's life savings, which were handed to him with surprisingly reckless speed, Blown on a few months of cheap thrills, so hungry his dinner table is a shared pig pen, he finally takes his first steps out of the mud and toward home. I will get up from this place, he resolves, and go to my father, confess it all, and beg him to take me on as a hired hand. I am no longer worthy to be called his child. But I wonder, is this contrition or conniving? Or as someone in Arizona walking by a cell phone tower masquerading as a cactus once said, that cactus is humming. <laughs> Maybe his coming to himself is returning himself home to take advantage of his father again. Sincere or not, before he even has a chance to make his rehearsed speech, this parent sees their youngest child on the edge of the lawn and has a visceral reaction. The Greek says he is moved with profound compassion from his splachna, his guts. It is the same word used by Luke some eight chapters earlier in the gospel when Jesus witnesses a funeral procession of a widow who is going to bury her young child. 
It is a word implied much like the Hebrew word rachamim, which means womb used throughout the Hebrew scriptures to speak of God's compassion upon seeing humanity suffering. A boundaryless love emerging from the core of being itself that perceives the possibility of new life in what was once thought to be dead. Strike up the band, indeed. Meanwhile, Junior's older brother is stewing in the fields alone. What separates this one from their father is not bad deeds, but good deeds, consistently good deeds. Look, for years now, I've done every single thing you've asked me to do. I never disobeyed even one of your orders, yet you never so gave me so much as a kid goat to celebrate with my friends. But then this son of yours can't even say his name or acknowledge the relationship comes home after going through all your money, and you kill the fatted calf for him. But my child, the father replies, splachna still churning with compassion. You are with me always. Everything I have has always been yours. But we have to rejoice and celebrate. This brother of yours was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, and now he's found. It's as if this parent is saying, when either of you is alienated from your sense of belonging and acceptance here, the family is not whole. One sibling left and realized what they were missing. The other never left and fails to realize what he had all along. But both are loved and invited to come home. Home, which as the parable seems to insist, is both a geological location and a state of being. The parent is a prodigal too. Wasteful, giving freely, lavishly, for goodness sake, deserved or not. And that is precisely the point. Things like grace and generosity are inherently unfair. I think Jesus' parable offends because it invites us to consider a new economy. One not built on the relentless and exhausting quid pro quo that defines so much of our world today, but something entirely new, an economy built on restoration, reconciliation, and the resurrection that follows being loved into a second or third or fortieth chance. If the parent in this parable does indeed represent the divine, what profound truths this holds for confession. We admitted to God. Oh, the wisdom here in this order. To the divine first, we share honestly whatever it is that has come between us. Whatever the behavior that followed from our addictions to sex or substances or spending or to our addictions to perfectionism, people-pleasing, and perpetual productivity and everything in between. Trusting there is nothing we can bring that is not meant with deep compassion and love. In our sharing, we discern and discover the divine loving us in the very places we cannot or will not or dare not love ourselves. As Richard Rohr says, God does not love us if we change. God loves us so that we can change. These are steps toward home. In our creation, wrote Julian of Norwich, we were knit and one to God. By this we are kept as luminous and noble as when we were created. And confessing our wrongs honestly, and facing the reality of our behavior without distortion, we declare ourselves ready for a more courageous road, one in which a previously defended identity might fall away, or the disease of our particular addiction loosen its hold, lose some of its power, and now be understood as a working delusion that kept us busy, that kept us away from the real party. Next, we admitted to ourselves the ego gets to overhear our unburdening prayer. 
In this way, writes Dr. Valerie, we ease into the full impact of confession, feeling the pain we have caused to such a degree that the very idea of causing that pain again is anathema. Our true self also gets to overhear our prayer. Our true self, whose ground is love, it puts a question to the ego. Are you finally ready to let this go? Let me hold us with the same gentleness as does God. With our yes, we are finally ready for the final phase of step five, admitting the exact nature of our wrongs to another human being. Rabbi Rami Shapiro aptly describes the difficulty of this final part. It's like having someone follow you around video recording your life 24-7 when you're at your worst and then sitting down with you and watching it on replay. Nothing is hidden. It isn't just humbling, it's devastating. But it is also liberating. When we admit to another the exact nature of our wrongs, we invariably have a human and humanizing encounter. As many in recovery say, there is no one way to do this final phase of step five. But there is a key element, the trustworthiness of a sponsor, teacher, mentor, or spiritual leader, or friend. When another person listens to us completely and without judgment, one we can trust to never use what we've shared or done against us and loves us into new life, that encounter is not only humanizing, but is an encounter with divine love as well. Who is that person for you? Who might it be? Accountability is a necessary source of strength as our journey takes us further into wholeness. When we accept who we are, a person with a capacity to do great harm, a capacity a trusted one now knows, and yet a person inherently good and with an even greater capacity to love, and grow in the likeness of the one in whose image we are made. We find we have access to a power to reshape our habits, which give birth to new character. And as we change, we remember the conditions which gave rise to our new and healthy ways of being. And we learn to consistently create them again and again. We begin to repair, make amends, receive and offer forgiveness, forge a new path. But alas, let us not rush ahead. In the art of confession, a sacred rest becomes available to us, echoing Cole Arthur Riley. We lose the facade and become like the trees in Mary Oliver's poem who call to us that we too have come into the world for this, to go easy, to be filled with light, and to shine. To be who we are, truly, flaws and all. And like the rooms call to any in need, it is never too late to begin again. Fifteen minutes clean, welcome home. Shame so heavy, we swear to God we'll carry it to our grave, welcome home. Here you are safe, loved, unburdened, Whatever it is you need to unburden, welcome home. Can we learn to do that for each other? Continue nurturing those kind of relationships here. Call to each other like Lucille Clifton. Come, celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Be living reminders for each other that we belong to the heart of a God who holds the fullness of our experience even as we become its tangible expressions for another. Of the many moving moments of yesterday's first planting of our community garden on Nancy White Way, the transferring of each plant from its temporary pot into its permanent home in a brand new ecosystem was most special for me. See, for each to be healthy and grow as part of these new fields of medicinal and culinary plants, roots that were packed and stifled in the bottoms of these pots 
had to be tickled, loosened, freed again before being placed in the ground. Doing so allows them to take root again as they become nourishment for the many new insects that will find a home on our campus and the neighbors whose homes surround it. What have we kept packed down and hidden for too long? What is stifling a freer, more abundant life? Loosen it. Let it out. Let your roots free to find the home of new ground this week and see what grows. Amen.